That's what we call it. And that's what we say that acute intestinal pseudo obstruction. So I'll take you through, try to take you through this and try to understand as a clinical case. It's a classical case of a elderly male gets admitted in intensive care unit with a known medical comorbidities, hypertension, coronary artery disease, Parkinsonians, and recently had a fall and fractured the hip. Patient is being stabilized before any intervention and before undergoes any intervention, develops obstipation, abdominal pain, and distension, and occasional vomiting. Patient has no fever, no rigors, there's no bleeding per rectum. On examination, we find patient is afebrile, mild tachycardia, normotensive, normal oxygen saturation on room air. But abdomen is soft, obviously distended, with mild tenderness in one quadrant. But there's no rebound tenderness, there is no guarding, there is no rigidity, and bowel sounds are sluggish. In labs show mild leukocytosis with a mild hypokalemia. I've not mentioned it here, but the calcium was lower than normal. Rectal examination was not documented on admission. We'll talk about that later. So this is a, when we see a patient like that in our ICUs, what are the various things which cross our mind? Is it related to the basic disease? Patient had a fall, had a fracture. We must rule out that the patient does not have any intra-abdominal trauma, though the almost four days have passed since this patient had a fall. But still, I think it's a better to rule out any intra-abdominal trauma. But the various other things which come to mind, does the patient have colonic obstruction? Does patient have toxic megacolon? Does patient have ischemic colitis or has perforated intestines because of the previous trauma or some other reason? Now, with this differential diagnosis picture, we go on to examine the patient. But at the same time, we also think whether the patient has acute colonic pseudo obstruction. So the commonest causes of mechanical obstruction in a setting like that is a fecal impaction. So that's when I said the bus to a per rectum examination, which was done, and rule out that there are no impacted feces. If the feces are impacted, one should do a manual evacuation and make sure, make sure that, 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 is, uh, that is taken care of before you proceed for anything else. Now look at this X-ray. We order immediately an X-ray. So it rules out a number of things. There is no free air. So it rules out more or less a perforation. The colon is dilated in its entire, and you can see the gas in the rectum. And that's very important because a colonic or mechanical obstruction can cause obstruction here. I know I've cut the lower picture, but I can assure you that this X-ray had shown us gas up to the anal canal. So the, when you look at an X-ray like this with the dilated bowel loops called colon like this, must focus on this part and look at this gas up to the anal canal. So that otherwise per rectum examination will also, but if you find that it's cut off here, please go in, put in a sigmoidoscope and make sure that there's no growth in the colon or rectum. And so the note in air in the rectum and the colonic dilatation, which is diffuse. Quite often in pseudo obstruction, you may find dilatation only in the right colon. That is also possible. So, but then this is what it shows. In addition, when you, uh, what the differential diagnosis that we thought of, you know, toxic megacolon usually has a clinical setting of a ulcer, severe ulcerative colitis. 
And we define that if the transverse colon diameter is more than six centimeters. But then this patient has no background or uh, history of that. So we don't consider that. But, but this is when you look at dilated colon like that, the most important thing that you see in this clinical setting, which I mentioned earlier, mechanical obstruction, fecal impaction, volvulus, you look at any perforation, you look at any toxic matter colon or ischemic bowel. But look at this is the uh, uh, dilated colon with a thickened colonic wall and you can see it actually a uh, loop like that. So if you have to look at the various causes of colonic obstruction, colonic obstruction is 25% of all intestinal obstructions in USA. And volvulus is the most common cause in about 3.5%. While acute colonic pseudo obstruction, you have about 100 cases out of one lakh inpatient admissions per year. But surprisingly, this colonic volvulus is a very high incidence reported from Middle East and Africa. And why is it so? Maybe it's a short mesentery based some, uh, uh, some traits there. I'm not able to, in a position to comment on that. So when you look at this type of a picture, you have to look at the demographic evaluation. You have to evaluate demographically, usually elderly, debilitated and hospitalized patients with multiple comorbidities. And the investigation of choice after a scout film is a contrast enhanced CT scan. And when I say contrast enhanced CT scan, this is IV contrast. I'm not talking about the intestinal contrast, oral or per rectum. Because in a dilated, uh, this thing I like read, it will be difficult to give a uh, and tell uh, contrast. And acute colonic pseudo-obstruction, colonic dilatation with possible transition zone, and no obvious mechanical cause of obstruction. While in volvulus, the dilated colon with mesenteric world sign, I just try to show a film of that, it is almost 100% sensitivity and 90% specificity. So that's what it is, that you see the world of mesenteric vessels here in the middle of the, this thing. This is called classical world sign with that which you diagnose because what happens is, this is a tra trans mesenteric uh, rotation of the colon, sigmoid colon. The, usually the volvulus occurs with the sigmoid colon and rarely with the cecum. So what this is a, uh, actually see, recently I saw a volvulus of the cecum case. Um, Actually, it came to me for a medical opinion from uh, South India on a medical complaint ethical uh, board issue, which is not very common, but much more common is a sigmoid colon volvulus. So these are the few films. I mean, sometimes you can pick up the complications of this like ischemia and perforation. If you look at this, you can see the air in the, sub, uh, air in the uh, wall of the colon, hugely loaded colon with the dilated ones. So, now let's go back. So with this picture, our patient had acute colonic pseudo obstruction. And let's go into its definition. I mean, it was first described by Ogilvy, and that's the reason acute obstruction like that is also known as Ogilvy syndrome or Ogilvy's disease. It, is, it shows a marked dilatation of the colon in the absence of mechanical obstruction. It generally develops in hospitalized patients over a period of days. And 95% of affected patients have an associated medical or surgical condition. So that's very interesting. Now, what are these various conditions with which it has been associated? There are a huge, long list of them. And normally, most of them will have multiple of these. The patients, I mean, I put it cardiovascular, metabolic, neoplasia, post-traumatic, and in our setup, I think we see lots with the spinal cord injury, pelvic trauma, and femur fracture. This is very common uh, in day-to-day -day, uh, ICU practice. And of course, drugs are more, and this patient had Parkinsonian. This patient had a femur fracture. And Parkinsonian uh, drugs 
and opiates and uh, is not a big problem with us but narcotics are a big problem in the west and then same way are there any inflammation pelvic abscess neurological uh, already mentioned that post surgical uh, hip surgery and spinal cord injury comes back again so all these conditions one or more than one usually you find more than one are commonly associated it doesn't happen in a walking around patient in a normal routine patient it uh, develops over time and there has been a path to, uh, it has been postulated this occurs from ineffectual colonic motility caused by excessive sympathetic stimulation and parasympathetic dysfunction or both so it's basically a autonomic system disturbance which leads on to this lack less lack of peristalsis now how do we uh, what is the parameters which make us say it is a acute colonic pseudo obstruction number one you need to rule out any mechanical obstruction and then the colonic diameter is usually 9 cm or so so perforation do happen but these are uncommon these perforations i'm talking about as a complication of pseudo obstruction so it's it's a more of a diagnosis of exclusion when you rule out any mechanical obstruction and earlier we used to believe that water soluble contrast anema is the diagnostic modality it has been not totally replaced by uh, ct scan uh, water soluble contrast we do not do colonoscopy as a routine in this to exclude mechanical obstruction except in a limited number of patients where you find on x ray that there is a cut off in the rectum area you do a sigmoidoscopy to check for that and again i am refocusing that mechanical obstruction rarely occurs in a patient admitted for unrelated illness like in this patient patient was admitted for a different reason and when we developed this this thing so it's rarely that you will find any mechanical obstruction in these patients now can these patients have complications yes ischemia colonic ischemia is the most common 10% have it at the time of colonoscopy perforation has been reported on different series in 3 to 25% once it occurs normally i don't think it is so common i don't think it's more than 2 to 3% at least in our practice we don't haven't seen it very often but once it happens it is catastrophic mortality is almost 50% the reason is the clinical setting these patients are sick they have a co multiple comorbidities and they have admitted for some particular other reason and so when they develops it is usually picked up late and then it uh, has a high mortality but at the same time this also reinforces that you should diagnose them early to give them a better outcomes now this perforation occurs more where the cecal diameter is more than 10 to 12 cm and the duration of distension is more than 6 days so these are the rough so that's the reason early pick up and early intervention and uh, for that these two parameters on a plain x ray are important to us so finishing the diagnostic part you feel suspected you do a ct or gastrograph in anema true intestinal obstruction is excluded and then you go for institute your conservative treatment conservative to begin with what we say conservative management is the preferred choice abscess of perforation peritonitis cecal diameter of more than 12 cm and or significant abdominal pain should be ruled out if it's an uncomplicated straight way we introduce conservative management and what is this conservative treatment first and foremost identify if there are any precipitating factors and the common ones are drugs like opioids or anticholinergics antidepressants antiparkinson whatever it is you should take care of those fluid and electrolyte correction like this particular patient potassium was low and calcium was low calcium is a very important factor here please focus on that correct all this make the patient kneel by mouth and decompression of the proximal gut by nasogastric tube if there is associated infection any part of the body that is again a precipitating factor and please treat infection 
So if you look at that, you're not doing anything active in the conservative treatment. What you're doing is correcting the issues, stopping the drugs, treating infection, fluid electrolyte. If you can ambulate this patient, it helps. It's not easy. And serial assessment of colonic diameter via abdominal radiograph. So one way to follow them up is to when you find that the distension is going down, patient is passing flatus, stool, bowel sounds are appearing. That's one part. But the very, if you're not very clear, convinced, then the best way is to look there. And overall success of, uh, uh, look at the colonic diameter on a serial X-ray. But overall success rate of conservative approach is pretty high, 77 to 96%. So don't go for any heroic measures right in the beginning. Unless you are looking at any complication or suspecting any complication, you know, quite often we get a call, doctor, come and do the decompression colonoscopy. Please do not rush for that. First 72 to 96 hours, these are the treatment approaches. The only thing that you need to look at initially that rule out other causes. And quite often we have seen the patient had been having a rectal growth and it goes undiagnosed. So please look at that. Trial of conservative treatment for 48 to 72 hours. And if it fails, consider pharmacological intervention. Number of drugs which have been used I mean, these also we are not advocating right in the beginning, but the key drug that we need to look at is a neostigmine, which is you all of you are intensively, you know better than me. It's the acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. This is a landmark trial by Kimi and 1999 in NEJM. Actually, it was very small number of patients, but at the same time, it's proved effective. Kimi at that particular time when this study was published was the president of the American Society of GI Endoscopy. And he was he used to talk about it that he said, when we give neostigmine, we just put a pan under the patient and you will see, hear the voices at the same time, you will see the something results immediately after giving this injection. Now, what is this? This is a trial that I meant talking about that it is a prospective double blind placebo controlled trial. Just look at it, the number, very small number, but created a lot of noise. All had abdominal distension and radiographic evidence of colonic dilatation with a cecal diameter of at least 10 centimeter and had no response to at least 24 hours. Right now we advocate that in three to four days trial of conservative treatment and majority of the patients up to 95% will respond to that. And the 10 of 11 patients who received neostigmine had prompt within half an hour colonic decompression as compared with none of the 10 patients who received placebo. And so excellent results. This is two milligram intravenous infusion over three to five minutes. Atropine should be available at bedside to reverse any side effects of bronchospasm or soon. Patient is kept supine on bedpan. Patients should have a continuous EKG monitoring with vitals for 30 minutes and a continuous clinical assessment for almost half an hour. So look at this. This is the X-ray before. On the left, you see the X-ray of an acute colonic obstruction. You give neostigmine, and after about half an hour, you have this X-ray. Now, this is one of the sample, but that's not a magic like that usually, but this is one of the uh, films that we are showing. So, since then, there have been three placebo-controlled, double-blind, randomized trials. All have shown the effectiveness of the range of 90%. There's one meta-analysis. This shows that uh, this uh, uh, resolution of acute colonic suit obstruction with neostigmine is higher versus placebo, very significant. And there is a systemic review it shows new statement associated with improvement in clinical symptoms, reduction in time to resolution, and res reduction of recurrence in patients who failed conservative treatment. But that's the important point that a lot of these patients, once they respond, they can have recurrence. So you need to look at that parameter as well. Partial responders or patients with the recurrence, second dose has been associated with the clinical response in 40 to 100%. It's not only second days, people have tried up to three doses at varying intervals. 
the young males with a post surgical status and electrolyte imbalance are risk factors for non response but electrolyte imbalance patients you don't take them on the uh, neostigmine arm unless you have corrected them so the uh, young male for some reason respond uh, less better with these do you, you know these side effects you face uh, you know that that all these symptoms side effects can happen related to gi system cardiovascular hypotension bradycardia and bronchospasm and because of that all these side effects you also avoid this drug with these symptoms patient having any symptoms of intestinal obstruction or urinary obstruction should not be given neostigmine and so are the patients of recent myocardial infarction patients on beta blockers asthmatics chronic obstructive pulmonary disease because they may not be able to tolerate uh, neostigmine now since this uh, uh, became available this modality became available people have tried to use subcutaneous neostigmine this one trial that i came across and there are two or three trials which have shown a continuous infusion of this thing obviously if you do that you are increasing the risk of side effects but that's how the people have tried of 0.4 mg per hour by missing 5 mg and 50 ml of normal saline over 24 hours in patients refractory to three bolus doses so uh, we have never been so aggressive in using neostigmine we do use bolus but we have never given infusion because most of our experience most of i mean uh, most of these patients are more sick and they have predisposed to one or the other side effects people have used oral paratostigmine people have used methyl naltrexone of course earlier ch chart i showed of prokinetics like domperidon and metoclopramide and there is one trial to show use of procalopride i'm not sure how the procalopride oral drug will be effective because how it gets absorbed and how it works but there are trials available in the literature we ourselves are not very aggressive in using any of these alternate medicines we have go we focus on conservative management and then we go up to new stigmin not beyond that now once this as i mentioned earlier significant number of them 30 to 40% can have recurrence now to avoid that now that's uh, uh, couple of trials on that that you use oral polyethylene glycol for 29.5 g every day for 7 days it has shown that it decreases the recurrence in a significant number of patients as compared to placebo in a randomized control trial so and that's a harmless thing polyethylene glycol basically uh, increases the moisture of the stool increases the bulk and with that it may the hypothesis is it may uh, stretch the my, uh, musculature of the bowel wall to induce peristalsis and it works but this is prevents the recurrence we have been using it uh, empir uh, empirically uh, to take care of the constipation but now there is a evidence available in the literature in the form of a randomized controlled trial that it is useful so i think it's a good modality to use for that because it's safe now the next intervention uh, we have talked about conservative treatment we talked about the drugs especially neostigmine and now we talk about colonoscopy decompression now there is a debate whether you should do only if the neostigmine fails or you can take it up straight away or the patient is not fit for neostigmine or you combine the two but in general you use it if neostigmine fails because mind it in a dilated colon like that colonoscopy is not a absolutely safe procedure it has to be done by an expert you have to take care of uh, have to take precautions there is no preparation and you must do a plain x ray beforehand to rule out perforation because the people have reported high incidence of perforation after colonoscopy in this clinical setting and sedation don't use any narcotics 
there should be minimum or no insufflation and whenever we are using it, make sure every endoscopic clonate or doesn't have it, uh, we of course are lucky to have that, but it should use CO2 uh, rather than a uh, room air. And best thing is to cause water infusion, which can distend it rather than to use. So use the minimum air and use the water infusion. Now we have the pumps available. You can infuse, uh, uh, infuse the water to distend the colon. Now, though I've written here, try to reach sequence, it is not necessary. If you have reached the proximal transverse colon, you can put the scope here and try to decompress as much as possible. Use liberal suction. And while coming out, you suck the throughout. Don't use the air uh, channel button to press like a push here because the purpose is decompression. Therapeutic scope is preferred if available. That's the technical part. Most of the time, therapeutic colonoscope is not available in the Indian endoscopic suites. Now, this is something which I'll uh, spend a minute. Decompression tube. Should we use? You know, we everybody talks about the flatus tube. Flatus tube is not the same as a decompression tube in the colon. Flatus tube is put in the rectum and it hardly works in this setting. If at all any tube works, is a decompression tube, putting it in the right colon or transverse colon and leaving it there. This is not easy done. It increases the chances of complication when you are doing that. And there is no evidence in the literature, no trials, no randomized trials, no regular trials to show that it works. And we hardly ever use it because once you decompress it and you take care of the medical treatment, as I said, it works. So decompression tube, please don't insist on it because it will unnecessarily increase the risk of complications. Initial success, 70 to 90%. Again, recurrence rate is here of 10 to 30%. That's where I mentioned, start using oral polyethylene glycol. Majority of them respond to a second decompression. So you can go in again if required. The additional advantage of colonoscopy is that you can 100% rule out a mechanical obstruction if there is any lingering doubt in mind. Perforation risk, 2%. Mortality is 1%. This is a, related to the procedure. I'm not talking about the perforation risk of the acute colonic pseudo-obstruction per se. Two retrospective studies showed better results with colonoscopy decompression over neostigmine. But these are retrospective studies, and we don't know the quality of the study. Surgery is reserved for patients with persistent chronic dilatation despite decompression and patients with perforation. And here, whenever you go for surgery, you would go for a limited surgery and not a full surgery, that is cecostomy or loop colostomy. And laparotomy should be performed in patients with peritonitis and non viral bowel should be resected. Usually patients who are unfit for surgery, percutaneous cecostomy is good enough. There are certain intrahepatic, intraoperative photographs. Bowel is distended. It's not easy to even close the abdomen once you open it. And you still look at the ischemia. As I said, 10% of patients will have cecal ischemia when you put the colonoscope in and you have a, something like diffuse ischemia also. So these are very scary photographs. You end up removing the entire, I mean, whenever you go for surgery, you have to remove all the non-viable, otherwise that itself becomes a source of uh, sepsis. And these are patients, otherwise also baseline, elderly and sick, so the outcomes are not great. So friends, I come to my last slide, which goes the algorithmic approach, and that is patient comes to you with an acute colonic distension in the ICU, Patient has usually multiple comorbid conditions. You are not you are suspecting a pseudo obstruction, but whatever it is, when there's a distension, first you should check for ischemia, perforation, or cecal valvulus. If it is there, go straight for surgery. If these are not there, then you need to look for any other cause of mechanical obstruction. If it is there, then you do appropriate therapy. As I said earlier, right in the beginning, that uh, sigmoid valvulus is an important differential diagnosis and also occurs in the similar clinical setting. So, but valvulus can be 
corrected even endoscopically, at least the, or palliative stand. So you can do that. Now, if it is an acute colonic pseudo obstruction, you have ruled out mechanical obstruction, you have ruled out ischemia or perforation complications, then you come that conservative management, which is to be used for three to four days or two to three days. And this is nothing else but nil orally, nasogastric tube, avoid offending medications, correct fluid and electrolytes, mobilize and treat reversible causes. If the patient responds, then you can consider low dose daily polyethylene glycone to prevent recurrences and deal them accordingly. But if there is partial or no response, then only you come for a new statement if there are no contraindications. And if some people will tend to combine the two, but if you normally if it does not respond to this, then you go for colonoscopic deep pressure. So the point that I'd like to highlight that please neostigmine and colonoscopic decompression come down in the algorithm. They don't come high in the algorithm. And if there's a success, you, then you again use polyethylene glycol. But if there's partial or no response, then only you consider surgery. Thank you very much. I hope it made some sense to you. I'll be glad to answer any uh, questions. Yeah, thank you, sir. So, uh, friends, please put up your questions if you have any. So, sir, just coming to the neostigmine. So, neostigmine 2 milligram over 10 minutes is the usual dose. And uh, what is the incidence of bradycardia? Because you have used it very often. So, do we need to really use atropine often? I don't say that we have used very often. We use it only when the conservative treatment fails. See, mm -hmm. as it is, we will not get more than one or two cases in a month of a pseudo obstruction in ICU. And out of that, majority of them will respond to the conservative management. But if we respond, obviously, I mean, if we have the right selection of patients that you've taken care of, that there is a, uh, uh, there's no uh, uh, contraindications, then we don't face it very often, patients tolerate it. So it all depends that how common it is, depends upon um, uh, how do you select your patients. So, uh, Conservative management should be there. If the patient has contraindications, we'll straightway go for colonic decompression rather than just it. So one comment has come from the audience, sir. They said the X-rays were, uh, you know, erect, erect X-rays are not possible in the ICU. So were they erect or supine and then should we go for CT straight ahead? No, I, you uh, take a sitting X-ray uh, in the ICU, that can be done. I know the quality is not very good in the portable machines and quite often the right portal machines are not available and it's not easy to shift the patient to the extra room it's a practical issue but if it is possible i think you should do both uh, supine as well as a sitting x-ray and if that doesn't give information then take the ct i will like i mean uh, somebody may say that can ct replace the plane x-ray yes it can but we all understand the sh uh, if you can shift the patient uh, uh, in the uh, uh, ct room then yes, that is CT straight with that would serve the purpose. Right. So, preferentially, sir, if shiftable, do the CT, otherwise get a supine and a sitting X-ray. Yeah. Sometimes the patient is not uh, shiftable. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's so fair next right. question is, sir, how to start nutrition when uh, the patient is recovering? See, uh, practically, uh, there's no strict guidelines on that. It's a clinical assessment on the bedside. If the patient is uh, uh, opened up over 24 to 48 hours, I like to start feeding because the nutrition is another major issue in these patients. You like to introduce anterior nutrition as early as possible. And so if you're, you feel the patient over 40, uh, 48 hours is doing well, passing flatters, distension has come down, you can hear the bowel sounds, then go ahead. And the X -ray, serial X-ray shows that the um, uh, colonic diameter has come down. The, I like to go back to the previous question. I think the X-ray, we should try to get it done, even if supine. The reason is serial assessment will be possible only with that and not with a CT scan. Uh, so uh, the role of his X-ray will be, uh, additional uh, reason will be for a serial assessment. And so feeding, I think, uh, uh, is a subjective decision on the table. Minimum 24 hours when you are confident patient is opened up, but you can, uh, to be on the safe side, 48 hours is good. Okay, sir. So then coming to the other causes of uh, megacolon, 
for example you have a toxic mega colon uh, you said ulcerative colitis that is one thing and then we often have c diff colitis c diff colitis or infectious colitis coming from the community so is their management a little different from this see c diff colitis usually doesn't present like a pseudo obstruction they, they like, may develop they may like develop right but if there, there should be some clinical parameters to suggest that usually but in a, if you are have a doubt then the best thing is to of course you are checking the c diff uh, toxin but better to do a simple sigmoidoscopy which is a safer uh, modality and make sure that there is no pseudo membranous colitis and take biopsies if it is suspicious otherwise uh, but the management for that is to treat the c diff you have to use um, uh, normally we start with metronidazole but most of the time you will end up using oral vancomycin uh, to treat that what about the risk for perforation and all if they seccum dilatation you know the the, <coughs> the they can be then we have to take them up for surgery or decompress them or what yes if uh, more than 10 cm of seccum people report that there is a high risk of perforation and then you should be and patient does not respond within 24 hours to the conservative treatment we like to decompress them actually uh, uh, if you find right in the beginning the seccum is so much of distended one can take up with the colonic decompression right at the beginning and use neostigmine as well if neostigmine as well if not contraindicated right so then just uh, last question so what are the possible causes of abdominal distension in the icu one is of course what you are talking about the differential diagnosis you know, suddenly patient starts developing distension your differential diagnosis and the kind of approach we should have there is a first slide that is our differential diagnosis of any toxic mega colon you have any other mechanical obstructions of any cause Valvular sigmoid valvulus is a very important cause of a uh, uh, bowel obstruction, and the important thing that I like uh, two points that I made: valvulus almost occurs in the same clinical setting as uh, uh, our acute colonic pseudo obstruction number one, and number two, usually patients with comorbidity and admitted for something uh, unrelated illness, mechanical obstruction is not that common. that's uh, but fecolit impaction is very important which i highlighted right in the beginning so these are the things that you need to look at but other than that various things ischemic bowel or a, a pancreatitis that can all that but then those are unrelated illnesses that you need to look at then of course ileal distension can also occur sir because ileus because of various causes hypokalemia drugs etc see all this when you talk about colonic pseudo obstruction is also a ileus and mm -hmm. then you look at uh, i mean when ileus occurs it is not isolated to the small bowel it could be a diffuse one and then uh, any day, all these precipitating factors uh, hypokalemia hypo uh, we focus more on uh, potassium but i think in this case we should also focus on calcium quite a lot and make sure that the patient's thyroid functions are okay dsh is very high then it will again it will not respond all those things have to, those are precipitating factors and one interesting would be idiopathic you know chronic pseudo obstruction which are never diagnosed and which undergo surgeries <laughs> come sometimes you know. the chronic pseudo obstruction is a different entity yes. i have not touched upon that yes yes just uh, oh, yes. absolutely that's it i think that there are no more questions uh, thank you very much and i thank the audience uh, mm. for uh, their uh, valuable time thank you sir with that we we'll thank you thank you i enjoyed it